Hi everyone. In this video I'm going to demonstrate how to use the Jamovi program in order to carry out exploratory factor analysis and mainly we're, we are going to be using the principal axis factoring approach. So what we have right here is some data that's opened up in the program. Uh, the data was actually contained in an SPSS file and I was able to import it into the program. Uh, really quickly, let's just take a look at the variables. These are basically items from a survey, and the items actually reflect um, different kinds of attitudes. So I'm just going to click on the first one right here, PQ1, and you can see that it says, in general, I am uninterested in politics, and it's being treated as continuous. Uh, P PQ2 is, I would rather turn off the television or radio uh, than be exposed to people debating about political issues. I like to interact with people who enjoy discussing political issues. So really the first 12 are reflecting sort of more of a uh, interest and involvement kind of uh, perspective when it comes to politics. And then we have, after that, we have some items. We'll go to uh, item 13 um, through the remainder, which is we have 24 items total. So items 13 through 24 are basically uh, coming from Bob Altemeyer's uh, dogmatism scale. So this item 13, it says, I may be wrong about some of the little things in life, but I am quite certain I am right about the big issues. Or someday I will probably think that many of my present ideas were wrong. That's actually a reverse scored item. So at any rate, we have 24 items and we're going to carry out an exploratory factor analysis on these items. And individuals could rate uh, the items on a, using a scale from one being strongly disagree to seven being strongly agree. So we're going to go under the analysis tab right here. And let me also note too, before we start analyzing the data, that I will have a copy of the uh, data set at, uh, provided as a link underneath the video description. So be sure to download that uh, if you want to follow along. So next we'll go to the uh, factor box right here and we're going to go down to exploratory factor analysis. So we'll click on that tab right there. And so whatever we do on the left, uh, you're going to see it being reflected uh, in the output on the right. So what we'll do is I'm actually going to highlight all of my variables and move them over to the variables box right here. And so uh, you can see that as we do this, uh, we have some output that comes up. And these are just basically factor loadings. And they're essentially reflecting the extraction method right here. Uh, the rotation being Obelman, you can see that kind of showing up right here. And then the number of factors is based by default on parallel analysis. So let me just say that um, rather than sticking with defaults, you kind of need to be thinking about what kinds of output that you want. Uh, for this demonstration, we're going to be focusing on principal axis factoring. So I'm going to uh, click on that. Um, if for my rotation approach, if I wanted, say, Verimax rotation, I can click on that. Um, and then you can still see that we have four factors that are being reflected, and that's based off of the parallel analysis. So basically with parallel analysis, the eigenvalues from your data are being compared against randomly generated eigenvalues. So um, next up, what I'm going to go ahead and do is click on screen plot right here so we can take a look at um, the uh, eigenvalues from our data, which is in you know, these blue dots right here. Uh, versus the eigenvalues that are simulated. So that's um, basically these cream colored dots. And you can see that essentially this uh, kind of over, the random eigenvalues begin to exceed the eigenvalues from our data at about the fourth factor. And that's why you see uh, the four factors being reflected in this table up above. Um, you can also, we can also request information regarding assumption checks, Bartlett's test, and KMO. A measure of sampling adequacy. Basically, what these are addressing is the question of, does it even make sense to carry out a factor analysis on the correlation matrix? So, um, so Bartlett's test is essentially a, uh, a test of the difference between your sample correlation matrix and an identity matrix where basically the off-diagonal elements would be zero, reflecting no correlation among the variables. So if this, if this test is significant as it is right here, 
then that would indicate that it is appropriate to carry out the factor analysis on the correlation matrix. If it's non-significant, that would be an indication that it's not really appropriate to uh, bother carrying out the analysis. Just keep in mind that this test is impacted by sample size, and so uh, given that factor analysis generally tends to be more of a large sample procedure, it's very easy for this to be significant, even if you have fairly trivial correlations within the matrix. Uh, down here, you've got the KMO measure of sampling adequacy. So first, you've got the overall measure of sampling adequacy, which is 0.870. Uh, zero. So essentially, if we use Kaiser and Rice's 1974 criterion, this would be uh, essentially being uh, considered indicative of a correlation matrix that is meritorious. So uh, basically, an unacceptable correlation matrix for factoring uh, would be a, a one that had an overall measure of sampling adequacy that would be less than 0 0.50, but that's still uh, a very low uh, bar um, to, to, to kind of work with. Uh, generally speaking, values that are in the 0.8s and 0.9s would be considered, again, sort of meritorious and um, of uh, basically of good quality, so to speak. So at any rate, we're, we're in good shape based on the overall KMO uh, measure of sampling adequacy. And then you've got measures of sampling adequacy related to each of the individual variables. And again, we're sort of using the same uh, system for describing you know, how adequate a given item is in terms of inclusion uh, in the factor analysis. And so you can see that all of these values um, really are falling largely in the 0.8s and 0.9s. I think there's the lowest one is a 0.729 for item 17 right there and a 0.755 uh, for this item uh, number uh, 15 right here. Or actually maybe that should have been 14. Sorry. It's a little hard to read. So at any rate, but you know, again, the items generally look like they are appropriate for inclusion in the factor analysis. Uh, if we click on the initial eigenvalues, then we get this table right here. And so these eigenvalues are basically what are showing up in this, this plot down here. So it's a plot of the eigenvalues against the, the uh, factor numbers. Now if we click on the factor summary, then what we get are the eigenvalues and percentage of variance accounted for following rotation. Remember that the rotation is Vermax rotation. So you can see that uh, the sum of squared loadings, these are the eigenvalues for the re uh, retained factors that are, again, based on this parallel analysis, which is suggesting a four-factor solution. You have the percentage of variance accounted for by the four factors right here. And then you can see that we have the cumulative percentage, which for the four factors is roughly 49.8%. Now, when it comes to interpreting the factors, we can scroll up and we, again, we get our Verimax um, uh, loading matrix right here. So uh, what we can do is we can look at the uh, relationships between the measured variables that we have right here and factors one, two, three, and four right here. And what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to say uh, high loadings below point Four. So right now it's 0.3. I'm going to set it at 0.4. Um, and, and essentially I'm going to adopt a loading criteria of 0.4, which is consistent with uh, Pittock and Stevens' recommendations in their book. And uh, so you can see that all of the uh, remaining cross loadings uh, are not evident in the table. So it doesn't mean that there are no loadings. It just means that all of these values um, are not showing up, and it makes it a lot easier to interpret uh, the factors because of that. So looking at this, you can see that you know all of these items right here, uh, items one through seven, all seem to load uh, nicely onto the first factor. Then you also have uh, items nine, 10, 11, 12 right here loading onto the first factor. And basically, the actual items, if you go back and look at the um, the uh, characteristic, the actual wordings, uh, the positively lo loaded items are really reflecting sort of an interest and involvement, sort of an affirmation of being interested in involvement in politics, and the negatively loaded items are reflecting sort of a disinterest and disinvolvement with politics. So 
the first uh, factor is largely reflecting the, you know, that idea of being interested and involved in politics. Then you have the second factor right here, and you can see that we've got item 13 loading on this, item 15, item 17. Uh, we have down here item 20. Uh, we have 22, 23, and 24. All of these are loading nicely on this. And so uh, we, we did have this one uh, negatively loaded item, but by and large, this factor, uh, the items loading on that uh, seem to reflect sort of a dogmatic certainty. Remember that uh, items 13 through 24 were coming from Bob Altemeyer's uh, scale measuring dogmatism. The third uh, factor right here, you can see that we have item uh, 16, uh, item uh, 18 right here, item 19, and 21, and that's really reflecting more of a uh, beliefs or flexible beliefs factor. Then we do have item this factor four over here, and we had two items that seem to load uh, onto that factor. And generally speaking, you don't want less than three indicators on a given factor. Um, and so what this would actually be an indication of is that maybe we sort of over factored um, our correlation matrix based on the parallel analysis results. And so what we can do is we can actually uh, go under here, we can fix the number of factors to three. So I'm going to click on press three right here and hit enter. And so now you can see our results showing up again. And so again, there's our initial eigenvalues. You can see the KMO, Bartlett's test, all that's the same. But now under the factor statistics, we have factors one, two, and three with the eigenvalues for those um, those uh, rotated factors, percentages of variances accounted for, and so forth. And then as we scroll up here under factor loadings, you can see that all of these items, basically questions 1 through 12, all load cleanly onto factor 1. Factor 2, again, pretty much just reflects that dogmatic certainty I was telling you about. And then factor 3 is largely reflecting that uh, belief flexibility factor. Now, if it's the case that you want to, um, let's say instead of using Vermax rotation, we decide that we want to use Promax. So we can click on that. And basically, Vermax rotation is one type of orthogonal rotation, meaning that uh, after rotation, the factors are remain uncorrelated, whereas uh, an oblique rotation, which Promax is one, uh, basically relaxes that constraint and allows for the rotated factors to correlate. So Essentially, when we are looking up here in our factor loading table, you can see that we have Promax rotation, and you know, generally speaking, when you're when you're running um, an oblique uh, running factor analysis and requesting oblique rotation, there are actually two types of matrices that you could theoretically interpret. There is the structure matrix, which contains the zero order correlations between the measured variables and the factors. And SPSS actually by default will print that out for you. Uh, but the other matrix is also a pattern matrix, which again, SPSS will give that to you uh, as well. But it looks like in Jamovi, you can only get the pattern matrix. Um, and the pattern matrix just basically the uh, coefficients are interpreted uh, analogously to the uh, standardized uh, beta weights in the context of regression analysis. Essentially, it's reflecting the relationship between a given measured variable and uh, and uh, the factors, uh, while also controlling for the fact that the factors themselves are intercorrelated. So, as you can see right here, using that loading criteria of 0.4, uh, again, you can see that basically items 1 through 12 really cleanly load on to that first factor. Then again, you've got the remaining, the next factor, factor two, really uh, again reflecting that uh, dogmatic belief uh, co uh, concept that I was telling you about. You'll notice it down here uh, after using the Promax rotation, that negative loading actually did not appear. So um, there's, uh, there's even kind of less ambiguity on, with respect to that on this particular factor. And then we've got factor three right here, which again, we have the loadings reflecting sort of a belief flexibility factor. Now the uh, uniquenesses that you see right here, these are communality estimates reflecting the proportion of variation in uh, the variables that are accounted for by those retained factors. 
Now let's say that we want um, correlations among the factors. Well, we can click on this button right here under additional output and you'll see that we have a little correlation matrix down here. And I'll be honest, in SPSS those values are actually different. And I did a little bit of investigating and it looks like these are correlations among the factor scores uh, rather than uh, you know just kind of the fitted factors, if you will. Um, so you know just kind of keep in mind there's a little bit of a difference um, in the output. Uh, you may think that this is the factor correlation matrix. It's actually a matrix of factor scores. So just kind of keep that in mind. Also, one other thing that uh, might be a little bit confusing up here under the factor statistics, you'll see that you've got these eigenvalues and percentage of variance accounted for and cumulative percent, which is kind of strange to get uh, following an oblique ro a rotation because the factors are correlated. So, in other words, any eigenvalues and the percentage of variance accounted for is actually not additive. You can't think about it from that standpoint. So, I'm not exactly sure what to make out of this particular piece of output as it appears uh, in the Jamovi program. But, you know, if you were running this again through SPSS, you would get uh, eigenvalues that would appear in the table. And in fact, let me just kind of show you, this is it right here in SPSS. You'll see, um, you know, you've got the pre-rotation in terms of eigenvalues and percentage of variance accounted for. And then you've got these, these uh, eigenvalues right here following, rota following the oblique rotation, basically our, our uh, Promax rotation. And you'll notice it says when factors are correlated, the sum of squared loadings cannot be added to obtain a total variance. So uh, again, I'm not exactly sure why uh, this table appears as it does in uh, Jamovi. So basically my uh, recommendation is no, to not spend much time looking at this particular piece of the output. But you know basically the remaining output uh, looks good and um, that's essentially how you can carry out uh, the uh, principal axis factor analysis using the Jamovi program. Thanks for watching.